Kaplan, former professor of physics at MIT, author of Every Life is on Fire, currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. Dr. England. Thanks very much. Uh, so today we're continuing in the general theme of korbanot, offerings that are meant to be brought uh, in the Mikdash, in the temple. And uh, last time we started off by, by talking about the question of whether HaKadosh Baruch Hu still desires uh, korbanot according to at least particular statements by his Nevi'im, his prophets, that sometimes are used to argue that he doesn't. Uh, and there's more to be said about that. And, you know, that's that's a subject to continue some time, especially looking uh, also at how it's handled in Chazal and in the, the sayings of our sages. But I wanted to, to pick up on something carrying us in a little bit of a different direction for today uh, and try to talk about ideas about why in particular part of what we offer in the Mikdash uh, is expected to be animals, like animal sacrifices. Uh, so uh, there, there are a lot of different perspectives that you could take on this question, and I'm not sure we'll touch entirely on all of them, but I, I wanted to uh, bring just a few sources, and I don't have a source sheet today, but I'll, I'll just read here uh, from Tanakh a little bit, and then that will kick us off, and, and we can just ruminate a bit on the question of, okay, fine, let's suppose that Akadosh Baruch Hu wants us to bring something to him uh, in a temple that we built for him. But why the specific things that are commanded in the Torah? How do we begin to understand uh, why it matters in a sense what we bring? Why can't we bring anything that's of value to us that we're offering up to him? And in particular, uh, why would it not be sufficient or acceptable to have a completely vegetarian situation? Why does it seem like there's a specific central demand uh, for animal sacrifice and particular animals like sheep and cows and the like? Uh, and a famous source to, to start off with this uh, subject uh, comes early in, in Sefer Bereshit. It's the, the story of Cain and Hevel or Cain and Abel. Um, and, and so we read uh, in, in Sefer Bereshit, so that this is uh, finishing up with the, the bearing of Cain and Hevel. This is, so it's talking about Chava. She continued to bear. At Ahiv at Hevel, Vayhi Hevel or Eitzon, Cain Haya Oved Adama. So Hevel was a keeper of sheep, uh, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Vayhi Minchetz Yamim, Vayave Cain Mipri Adama, Minhal Adonai. So it came in the passage of time that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to Hashem. And Hevel brought from the firstlings of his flock and of the fat of it, and Hashem showed respect for Hevel and his offering. Well, Cain, well, Minhato. So Cain, uh, his offering is not shown the same uh, reception, and Cain's angry and his face has fallen. And so that's the trigger of this crisis where Cain has a problem to fix. Uh, he, as an agriculturalist, has brought... <coughs> excuse me, an offering from the fruits of his labor, but they're not animals, they're literally fruits. Uh, and Hevel, who's a, uh, a shepherd, he can bring uh, a, an animal offering, a lamb or a sheep or something like that. Uh, and, and so then, now one of these is accepted and one of them is not. It's not stated here mm -hmm. what acceptance or non-acceptance is, although we can maybe infer it from other places in Tanakh where it's about you know, a fire and a column of smoke in some sense in which the offering is is being properly taken up. Um, uh, and and th there could be other things you could layer on top of that. But in any case, uh, there is this sense in which we're already being shown a those Baruch who somehow has a preference. And granted, there's a lot of backstory here we're not seeing, and you already don't know, is the problem with the kind of thing that's being brought, just from the text that we just read, or could it be somehow the intention or the way it was brought Right, we don't get a lot of details. So maybe Kain, if he had brought the right kind of offering of fruits and grains and vegetables or what have you, that would have been accepted. And maybe Hevel uh, could have brought in 
unacceptable offering of sheep or of animals. I mean, we certainly know that even according to Alakha, that he could have brought sheep that had blemishes on them, or he uh, could have brought the wrong kind of animal for, uh, for the wrong kind of sacrifice. Um, but in any case, there's now this exchange, or maybe it's sort of a, a, a lecture that Akadosh Baruch gives to Hevel, uh, where he, he asks him, why are you angry? You know, why is your face fallen? And then there's this somewhat cryptic statement that Akadosh Baruch makes to Hevel, Halo im tetiv said, ve im lo tetiv la peta hatat rovets, ve lecha tshukato, ve ata tim shalbo. So if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, then, you know, the translation of this is very tricky, but it's sometimes translated as sin crouches at the door, and to you shall be its desire, yet you may rule over it. So there we read the story. And we know that the way this ends is that Cain is going to kill Heaven. And we think of that as his great sin. And so it is easy for us to read into this line now that we're talking about the temptation to sin. Hevel is angry. Mm -hmm. He's envious of his brother. He wants to destroy his brother. Uh, and Akalos Baruch, who is in this kind of discussion with him where he's struggling with this temptation to do wrong and which he's ultimately overcome by. That is a reading that we often give to the text here. So the idea of hatat, the idea of sin uh, that's being invoked by this word hatat is uh, seemingly connected with the sin he's about to commit, the murder or the killing of his brother that he's about to perform. However, it is notable that the text doesn't use the word het. It doesn't use the word sin as we often see it uh, in Tanakh. Um, it, it uses the word hatat specifically. And interestingly, in virtually all, or maybe I can say all other places, but at least virtually all other places that you find in the Torah where the word hatat appears, it's specifically referring to a korban hatat. It's referring to an offering, an animal sacrifice of a certain category. It's one that you bring when you've committed a sin. You have sinned, you've committed a het, and because you have done this thing, then therefore you bring a korban chatat, and it is partly burnt on the altar and is partly eaten by the kohen. Uh, and, and so it, it becomes part of the ritual of uh, atoning for one's wrongdoing. And it is interesting to ask the question, why in the first place was Cain bringing an offering, right? He, we are told, chose to bring an offering, and that seems like he had the right you know, to be the first person to come up with the idea of bringing an offering, it's hard to be suspicious of their kavanah. You know, he had the intention of giving some gift to Akados Baruch Hu, and you'd think you'd want to celebrate that. But maybe he actually felt like he'd already done something wrong that he had to atone for, right? It could be that this was his attempt at inventing an, uh, a, a korban chatat. Uh, and if so, that may be part of the point is of why it wasn't acceptable that specifically perhaps for a chatat, as opposed to bringing tormot of some kind, you know, there are other instances where we bring bikurim, the fruits of our fields, and we offer them in this way that also is kind of going into the system of the mikdash and we're giving them to Hashem, so to speak. Uh, but to make an offering of priyadama, of the fruits of the ground, when perhaps you have already committed a sin for which you're trying to atone, uh, perhaps the Torah is saying, no, that in this case, you want a, a chatat, you want an animal. And, and there's more that suggests that. Because the, remember, that in the Pasuk, we have la petach hatat rovetz. So sin crouches at the doorstep, that's usually translated. But petach is also a word that if we look all over the Torah, it maybe appears once at the doorway of Lot. But other than that, petach is very reliably part of the formula or phrase, petach ohel mo'ed. It's the opening of the tent of meeting, which is the uh, central, it's, it's, it's part of the structure of the Mishkan, the central structure of the Mikdash. So it's the, the, the tabernacle or part of the tabernacle. So Ohen Moed is a place to which you bring uh, animal sacrifices. You bring it to the altar nearby. Um, and, and so there's a lot of things that get brought before Petach Ohen Moed. And it's not just La Petach Hatat, that there's a Hatat next to the Petach, but also La petach hatat rovetz. And rovetz is a verb that refers to crouching. So where are there other uses of the word rovetz? Now, if you go throughout the Torah, 
it refers in various places to a donkey that's crouching, like when it's referring in some of the berachot given to the tribes. Um, I, I believe uh, there also is, ref- I think when, when we're talking about the, the mother bird sitting on her eggs and, and shaluach haken, like sending away the mother bird to take the eggs, the verb is also used. There is a, a use of rovetzet to talk about deep waters underneath the earth and the blessing given to Yosef and Parshat Bezot the Bracha. So maybe crouching uh, isn't 100% always used for animals, but it's still quite suggestive that we have many examples of animals with legs that are actually crouching when the word Rovetz is used. Uh, and so when we have this whole formula, Petah Hatat Rovetz, it's the image of the opening, perhaps the opening of Ohel Moed, uh, and then a crouching thing, which is the chatat, and a chatat could be a korban chatat, which we know is an animal, and it makes sense that it's an animal because the verb rovetz is basically an animal crouching verb. So all of this is actually saying over and over and over again, part of the issue here perhaps is that Kain did not bring an animal, and that was what was being rejected, that he was being told, okay, uh, good job, nice of you, you want to bring an offering, but you need to fix this. It's, it's very simple why uh, Kain, uh, sorry, why Hevel made a mistake, or, uh, sorry, why Kain made a mistake and why Hevel was more successful. Uh, and it has to do with the difference between plants and animals. And, and the point basically here is that sometimes a Kadosh Baruch Hu requires of us that the kind of offering we make to him uh, is an animal. And now we, we have to start to understand why that's the case. Um, and Kain now makes the wrong inference perhaps, but he goes too far in another, in, in, arguably maybe in the same direction. Like he he, he overgeneralizes because what does he do? He goes and he kills a person. And there are elements perhaps uh, of human sacrifice in that murder or that killing. Uh, th- there's a reference to the idea of the ground opening its mouth uh, to receive the blood of Hevel from the hand of Kain, uh, which evokes among other things, pagan chthonic sacrifice where you're sort of pouring blood into the ground um, and where the, the, the ground is anthropomorphized as the earth that has a mouth uh, to choose to receive the, the blood of the sacrifice. Uh, so human sacrifice is not acceptable to Akados Baruch Hu. Uh, and that's another thing maybe that's hiding in the background here. But even the fact that Kain went and killed Hevel afterwards can be strung together with these other speculations uh, to cohere you know, with the idea that Kain was, in a sense, getting the point um, that he had failed because he hadn't offered something with blood. But then he, he thought, okay, now I have to do even better than heaven. And what's, what could be better than a sheep? Well, a person, right? That's, that's somehow an even more elevated thing to offer to Akados Baruch Hu. And of course, he was wrong and he failed. But that, that's the, the starting point, I guess. I, I just, I want to use that text uh, as a way to suggest that there may be various things you could read in that story, but one of the fundamental points is that Akados Baruch Hu sometimes desires and requires animal sacrifice specifically, uh, and that he's not satisfied uh, if we just try to keep things vegetarian. And that doesn't mean there isn't a vegetarian element uh, to what we bring, uh, but sometimes it, it doesn't suffice and it doesn't have the right properties. It, it doesn't fit the bill. Uh, and, and we have to start asking ourselves uh, what's different. Now, I, I think a, a sort of miscellaneous point you could you could string in that comes a little bit earlier than this, uh, that makes this point in kind of a less grave and direct way in connection with sacrifice, is that in general, if you try to think about the idea of vegetarianism, I think sometimes people look at Gan Eden, this initial state of humankind that's very paradisical, where you have Adam and Chava, and they're in this place with all this delicious vegetarian food, they're eating from the trees, um, and they, they seem to, uh, you can critique this notion, but sometimes we talk about Gan Eden as though it's this sort of perfected human existence from which we fell, and it's clearly more complicated than that. But still, I think you have to critique within that view, even if you see Eden as kind of a a, a a good place, a place that maybe in some sense we're trying to get back to, there's still a question of whether vegetarianism is part of, of, of the ideal that we're, that we're trying to return to. Because that sometimes is suggested. People look at Adam and Chava and they say, in this paradisical state, they're not eating animals. And maybe that's something we should be straining for or yearning for. I already think you have to, you have to give that notion a poke. Because if you look at what happens 
when Adam and Chava are leaving Eden, they have already made for themselves clothing out of plants, right? They used aletena, they used the, the, the fig leaves to cover themselves. And then what is it that Akados Baruch Hu gives them when he, when he expels them from Gan Eden? He gives them ktonot or, he gives them uh, tunics of skin, presumably animal skin. And the way he gives that to them, presumably is he, he sort of grants them the ability to figure out that this is a kind of technology that they can develop and use. Um, and, but the fact that it's not just they figured out a way to do this, but rather that their initial inclination was to cover themselves with plants, and then Hakadosh Baruch Hu is described as sort of intervening to improve the situation and making them wear, wear clothes of animal skins. What it points to is that at the very least, from the perspective of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, he says, "Look, there are some cases where it doesn't fit the bill to to just do things with plants. You're going to sometimes need to do things that will work better if you use animals to do that. And animals also are part of the world that I've created to be used for good purposes." when necessary. And so that doesn't mean you should go around and just kill animals for fun all the time. And it doesn't mean that uh, you should have this constant lust for eating animal flesh and, and, and never you know, be satisfied with anything else, et cetera, et cetera, like all the extremes that you could describe. But it does mean it seems that Akados Baruch Hu is not taking the attitude that some kind of morally perfected uh, existence would be one in which we never do violence to animals and we never use them for our purposes. It seems instead that Akados Baruch Hu's attitude is, if the animal fits the bill, if you need to use an animal in order to do something more successfully that I want you to do, then you should use the animal. Whether that's because you will be better dressed wearing animal skins uh, than if you're trying to cobble together garments out of fig leaves, or whether that's because there are things that a korban, that a, a sacrifice has to accomplish that can't always be accomplished just using grain or, or fruits or whatever else. That sometimes there needs to be an animal. Um, and so I, I think that does complicate anyone, any position someone might try to take where they, they, they see vegetarianism as some kind of uh, angelic or Edenic ideal that we're trying to get back to. At the end of the day, the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us is very much not a vegetarian Torah. It does not uh, maximally demand from us uh, meat consumption or, you know, it, it doesn't have a problem with eating other things necessarily, but it institutes a relationship to animals that sometimes has us killing them. Uh, and, and that's the thing that I want to start unpacking from different perspectives and, and asking the question why that might be. What might it be? about sacrifices uh, that are made of animals uh, that, that do, do things, that accomplish things that you simply cannot accomplish uh, if you don't involve uh, animals in some way. So uh, there, there are a few different points I, I thought to put out and, and maybe we'll have time to, to discuss some afterwards. And to some degree, these are, um, more speculative than I, I'm sometimes um, uh, putting forward in the sense that I'm, I'm not uh, prepared to go source by source today, but also I think for some of these ideas, they're just kind of musings about uh, the purposes that animals serve. Uh, so one of the things that I think we can start by saying about animals uh, is that they are more like people than anything else in the world. And at the same time, they are quite definitively not people. Uh, and that sounds like an obvious point, but the reason I think we have to acknowledge it, it draws a very bright line in the symbolic structure of what the Mikdash through the laws of the Torah provides for us is that if you think about what the, the Mikdash is supposed to be as a kind of place, there are two kinds of things that when you put them together, you suddenly realize they're very much opposite to each other. On the one hand, the Mikdash with regard to human beings is a place totally averse to and separate from death, right? Everything to do with death, we put as far away from the Mikdash as we can. So if someone has come into contact with 
a dead human body and they are tamim mit and they need to be purified uh, in order to remove that tumah. All the other kinds of tumah that can exist for a person that either have to do with emissions of a human body or that have to do with um, contact with certain kinds of animals uh, or anomalous disruptions in the skin, tzarat, lots of different things that all bring about tum'ah, ritual impurity. I would argue every single one of them, and I'm not remotely the first person to say this, in one way or another can be traced to connection with human death, right? Because it might be the little animals that are crawling near a cadaver, right? The, the sherets or whatever. Um, it might be that there are life cycle or bodily function or malfunction kind of events that in one way or another seem to evoke the partial death of the potential for life in one's body. There's also this element in the case of Tzarat of it being kind of like your body is half dead. And this is explicit in the language of Aaron Kohen uh, in the moment when Miriam is Mitzorat. Um, so Tzarat is partly about is being alive, but partly not alive and therefore uh, is associated with death. Uh, and so with regard to all these forms of Tum'ah, which are not just about even who can enter the Mikdash or the area around you know, Harabait, but also have to do with who comes in contact with the food that's given to the Kohanim, the Tumot that they eat, um, and, and all the different uh, laws and strictures associated with that. There's a whole elaborate structure that is trying to keep Kohanim and the Mikdash away from human death. Kohanim can't go to graveyards except for a select few relatives that they're mourning. Uh, Etc. Cetera, et cetera. You can just keep listing those examples. The Mikdash is about a place for encounter with and worship of Elohim Chaim, and that is about life, and it is not about death. Um, and we fully separate death and mourning from that place. And yet, if you now think about what else the Mikdash is, as far as the korbanot that are performed there are concerned, it's a slaughterhouse, right? It's it's a place where daily you have multiple mammals being slaughtered and their blood is being flung in different directions and they're being cut into different pieces. And it, it does not seem at the same time that it's a place that is not associated with human death. It is not a place that is disassociated from any kind of death. In fact, the opposite. It is a place where sheep go to die on a daily basis and other kinds of kosher animals may also go to die. Um, and, and not in a, in a sort of circumspect way where we, we keep that, we sweep that under the rug or, or keep it to the side. It is a very visible and gory spectacle often where the animals are being uh, cut into different pieces by the koanim and the pieces are being waved in different places and the blood is being deposited in different places. So what does that do? What do those two things together do? They take on the one hand, the idea of human life and its opposite, human death. And they juxt it's juxtaposed next to animal life and animal death, which are the closest thing to human life and human death that there is in the universe. And Akados Baruch Hu is saying, as much as according to my Torah, I am totally averse to any kind of human death being allowed in this place, no human sacrifice, but not just no human sacrifice, nothing remotely associated with anything to do with human death, I demand from you a steady stream of animal sacrifices so that there's animal death happening here in gory spectacle all the time. And what, that's, what that unavoidably does in a way that you cannot accomplish without the real physical infrastructure of animal sacrifices being performed there and human death being physically excluded from that space, what that accomplishes is uh, the creation of an incredibly loud and glaring message that our understanding of the world is one in which there is an enormous difference between human death and animal death. We do not see that as a small distinction or a quantitative distinction where we're a little bit like chimpanzees and we're a little bit less like sheep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we're, it's all a continuous gray spectrum. And, and maybe sometimes we're nearly as sad about a chimpanzee uh, as about a person or what have you, et cetera, et cetera. On the contrary, what the Mikdash establishes is an incredibly bright line saying, this is an ideological system in which human life has unique status separate from animal life. 
Uh, and and you, you can't reason your way around that. You're not invited to philosophize and say, well, when I look at a cow, you know, it seems like I have a lot of things in common with it. And I imagine what it's like to be a cow and, and maybe, you know, as uh, famous and uh, disturbingly uh, non-normative philosophers in elite academia have, have sometimes suggested, you know, maybe the, the inner life of a cow may be not so different than the inner life of a, of a human infant. And, and so really, you know, what's the difference? And, and maybe we, we both should be a little bit less worried about what we do to human infants and a little bit more worried about what we do with cows. This is the kind of thing that you can get to if you start by, by just musing in a, in a, in a free-flowing way uh, in the style of contemporary philosophers. Uh, and what the Torah is saying is simply no. That's, that destination of uh, speculation and philosophical musing is right out. It is excluded at the outset by a structure of practices that doesn't just make a statement to you in words, but, but makes a much more powerful statement in pageantry and in rules about who can be where in what physical space, et cetera, uh, that, that makes it impossible to see human life and animal life as different. And the point is that's not the conclusion of a philosophical argument. It's a foundational statement of an ideological system based on laws. So we're receiving the Torah from Hashem and Hashem is saying, this is foundational. Human life and animal life, not remotely the same. We have one place where even the tiniest speck of human death, uh, we try to sweep it away and expel it. Um, but meanwhile, it's an avatar for animals where you know you have this constant stream of animals going in alive um, and going out as smoke or as consumed food uh, or whatever else. So that I think is a, a first kind of point to make about what animal sacrifice accomplishes. And I, I do think that there is tremendous foresight and wisdom uh, in, in this, uh, or perhaps in the ancient world, in, in some sense, it wasn't uh, uh, as much foresight as it may now seem because there were lots of different kinds of ideologies competing in the ancient world and some of them really didn't set great value uh, on human life. And that it may have been more obvious um, in, in, in the generation to which the Torah was given that there were alternative views vying for supremacy uh, that wouldn't necessarily set a great store by human life. But it is, in, it is interesting to note, I think that the, as I already alluded, you don't usually get to just talk about, let's show more care for the perspective of an experience of animals uh, to such a degree that we would say, oh, well, we can't kill animals because they're uh, beings with agency in their own right, right? That if you start with a philosophical argument for some kind of vegetarianism or some kind of like, we shouldn't kill animals because it's kind of like murder, maybe it's not quite as bad, but um, it, it really amounts to more or less the same thing, especially with chimps or with cows or what have you, that when you start off letting yourself make that kind of argument, it rarely stops there. And, and I think ironically, while it begins by starting to seem like it's trying to elevate animals and, and have more moral restraints that get, get imposed on human behavior where we say like, uh, you know, murder of other human beings, of course we all agree that that's wrong. We would never do that. And now let's generalize that idea and realize that there are some additional strictures perhaps we should impose on ourselves. We should maybe perhaps never kill animals either because they're very innocent and, uh, you know, hapless and, and uh, we have all this power over them and they have agency and perspective as well. Somehow, even if the argument begins in that place, it may end with, and really, maybe we should be start, you know, maybe we should start to see human beings as commensurable with animals. And, and we could start weighing them on the same scale and say, well, look, how many cows can I make how much more happy uh, if I make these human beings some other quantity less happy? And, and I start in a way that may not be initially expected, but I think is a very common conclusion from this kind of a philosophical game, we start being willing to consider inflicting new kinds of suffering or restriction or even violence on human beings in order to protect larger numbers of animals in some bizarre utilitarian calculus. So that 
world of philosophizing is something that the Torah is axiomatically rejecting. It's not arguing against it on its own terms and, and, and proving to you that in fact animals somehow don't merit uh, to be treated in the way that human beings do. It's stipulating that. It's, it's, uh, it's positing that that's the case uh, and, and saying, learn this Torah from the creator of the world. This is how uh, he expects you to view things. Human beings and animals, not on the same page, not in the same category. Uh, and now there's a separate discussion we have to have now about the function of revelation and the difference between uh, arriving at conclusions uh, in the manner of a Western philosopher versus how we relate to things when we're, we're founded in Torah. That's a longer discussion that we don't have to have here and today. Uh, and maybe we can do a, a shiur where we take up that subject another time. But that's the, the assumption that I'm working with right now. We're assuming that the Torah is, tell, is gonna teach us some things that are our fixed points from which we reason uh, and that we don't prove to ourselves. And, and this is one of them. So that's something that has uh, been missing from Yahadut for thousands of years, but which we have a real opportunity uh, to have be part of it. Uh, the, the, the affirmation of the value of human life through the physical plant uh, of a sacrificial cult that focuses on animals and totally excludes uh, anything in connection uh, with human death from the same place. Uh, and, and that's one kind of point about why animals would accomplish that, because obviously if you didn't have animal sacrifice, you would never be able to draw that line. Uh, and drawing that line is so important to Akadosh Baruch Hu because of its implications for things like human sacrifice, perhaps, uh, that uh, he, he's willing to have animals be killed uh, in, in order to make that point. And that point is perhaps best made, obviously, by the Yakedah, right, the binding of Isaac. Uh, on the same Temple Mount, we have an instance where there is a substitute of an animal for a nearly sacrificed human child. Uh, and that transition away from the danger uh, to the potentially sacrificed human child uh, towards the uh, animal substitute uh, is in a nutshell, or, or, or let's say in, in uh, a, a brief vignette, an expression of all the ideas that we were just laying out in detail. So that's one thing that we can say, animal sacrifice surely accomplishes, uh, and, and, and we need to, to consider that carefully uh, and, and realize that's part of what Korbanot made of animals are supposed to be doing for us. Another thing uh, that is related, but it's still a different point, is that I think that it also has to be acknowledged that people, I wouldn't say universally or generally or always desire to witness bloody spectacles, but it has to be admitted that uh, the power of seeing blood, uh, that the power that that has over the human psyche uh, is one that uh, has to be reckoned with at some level. Meaning that there are some things that people need to do or nearly always need to do, or maybe in, in a mob, you know, that, that there will be some portion of the group uh, that has a, a, a hunger for this. And that if you're not going to ignore the human condition, because you have some philosophical idealism that's out of touch with the human condition, as is so often the case with what Western philosophy comes up with. And instead, you are addressing the human condition as it is and meeting it where it is, but finding ways to elevate and channel the things about human beings that you're not going to change. You know, and these, you could miscellaneously list, like we need to eat, or human beings have sexual desires, or human beings have uh, perhaps the desire to control a territorial space or land that they relate to directly by living in it. There are things that are very, very basic to people. They desire to reproduce themselves and have children. And, and all of these things, there are different kinds of cults and philosophies and, uh, and religions in the world that maybe have tried to say, you don't need this part. You can get rid of it. You don't need sexuality or, or you don't have to have a, a territorial geography that you're a part of. This is something that Yadu tried to do for 2000 years, uh, somewhat mistakenly. Uh, and, and then et cetera, et cetera. You can keep listing these things. Few would say foolishly enough, you know, you're, 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 you don't have to eat, but there are versions that try to come close to that. And here, I think you could say similarly, someone might say, we don't wanna, we don't wanna have relate to blood. 
people don't need to do that. Let's just sweep that under the rug, that part of our uh, biology or that part of our collective psyche. But you see in the wide world that when you don't create institutions that bring people into contact with those things, they often seek them elsewhere, right? Like there's a huge industry of movies and video games that are graphically and grotesquely violent, for example. And people become fascinated uh, with the simulated experience of witnessing gory events. And it's not all people who necessarily desire that or need it, but you might have to admit that it's a large enough number of people that now we have to ask the question, should there be a place that's rooted in Torah and rooted in atonement for sin and rooted in celebration of the living God and rooted in national festivals that bring people together to share uh, in the brachot and the blessings that they're receiving from their creator, all of those things that the Mignash is, right? Would you rather see have those people uh, who are also looking for a bloody spectacle go there to see it uh, and have them contemplate their own mortality and, and perhaps their own wrongdoing while they're witnessing the spectacle? Or would you like a, a horror filmmaker or action filmmaker, whoever, just to sort of make up a story that entertains and create that experience for the viewer uh, in the same, uh, that pushes on the same buttons uh, but does so in a way that has no mooring that connects it to any kind of ideological system related to morality. And in many cases, becomes a fantasy of amorality or anti-morality where, where people get to enjoy uh, the, 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 the dream of, of going around and, and, and shooting people or, or watching someone go, go and do that. Um, and, and sometimes it even can spill over into reality as one now sees far too frequently in the present day in the United States, for example. Uh, so I, I think that that is a, perhaps a smaller point than the first one that I made, but it's one that maybe could be reckoned with as well, that we should not be so quick to say, well, bloody spectacles are just a, a, a barbaric vestige of a different era when people were crazy and savage and they needed uh, to be satisfied in that way. And we are, are so much better than that now. And now that we have uh, successfully excised that aspect of the human condition from our psyches, we can dispense with this practice. It's not so clear that that's actually true about people in general. It may be true always of some people and, and less true of other people, uh, but uh, an institution like the Mikdash is for all of society, which means it addresses itself to large trends in the population. And it may offer different things to different parts of society that seek different kinds of uh, satisfaction or or contentment uh, when 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 they go to uh, uh, this this national center. So it must be admitted uh, that this may be part of the human condition to which the the, the animal sacrifices addresses itself, um, and and maybe that's necessary. Maybe that's the best elevation you can give to an instinct in, in human nature that we might foolishly believe we can eliminate, or we might foolishly desire to eliminate, which is maybe a more controversial statement, uh, because we don't always know exactly what happens to people when you try to eliminate things that are a basic part of uh, their nature. That's um, two points. And, and I think there's a, there's a last one, uh, which uh, I, I, I'm not sure at all that it's the last point that could be made in favor of specifically needing to relate to korbanot that are based on animals, but it's the last one I'll, I'll make today uh, and, and, and which uh, maybe will lead us into some more discussion. There's another aspect of this, which I think uh, is tricky philosophically, but maybe quite an important one, which is that we too often fall down a slippery slope of thinking of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the terms that we want to think of him as, meaning that we, we, of course, prefer for him to be our friend. We prefer for him to bless us. We prefer for him to comfort us. We prefer for him to liberate us. And even our, our liturgy and our, uh, our narratives emphasize the things about HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we most appreciate. He took us out of Mitzrayim. 
but he also, as it happened, put us in Mitzrayim, right? If he's really created the creator of the world, then he doesn't less do the things that happen in the world that we don't like. But in in seeking a positive relationship with him, we emphasize about his actions, those which we're the most grateful for, because those are the moments in which we turn towards him and he helps us to change. But the whole package deal is that okay, those Baruch who does things, sometimes that we feel more easily positive about, and sometimes he does things that we have a hard time feeling positive about, at least at the beginning, and sometimes always. And I think an important aspect of this point, also that animal sacrifice uh, really pushes under our nose, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sometimes demands of us that we participate in destroying his creations, and also that sometimes he destroys his own creations, right? I, mean, I could, could have maybe said those in the other order, that because it's a more general statement that Sometimes I get those Baruch who is in the business of destroying his own creations. That's part of what he does. That's part of the deal. He's not just Bore Olam, right? He, he creates the world, yes, but he is also a consuming fire as, as Esh Ochla, you know, a, a fire that burns things up. And he's referred to as such uh, in, in a variety of other places um, in, in the Torah. And so it isn't simple enough to, to say, he creates and we like what he creates and then something else destroys. That's very dualistic and incorrect, right? It starts to sound more like Zoroastrianism or something. He does everything. He's, he's involved in everything that occurs, including the disassembly of and destruction of things that he creates. And that is a point that it is easier to ignore when it is a less fearsome one. And so I think if we were just sort of burning wood on a fire, we would think of the fire as being something that we like because we like the light and we like the warmth and we wouldn't think too much about the fact that the wood was actually being destroyed by the fire. But when you take an animal that's alive and that resembles you to some degree, because it's also a mammal and you bring it in uh, and it's slaughtered and cut to pieces and burned up, right? That witnessing that process and even having in some cases to participate in that process, facilitate that process, it unavoidably forces on the human being, you know, it's particularly on of the Hashem, on Mamlechet Konim, on this nation of priests that Am Yisrael are supposed to be. It forces on us the realization that Akados Baruch Hu is both in the business of creating and also in the business of destroying, and that sometimes He commands us to destroy in ways that are consonant with what His Torah expects of us, and that that is something we have to be willing to participate in and accept uh, and, uh, and, and see as part of the whole package so that we don't just affirm the creative aspects, we affirm as a whole process, a, a set of different events that in many cases involve combination and creation of new things through novel combinations of things like the building of the Mishkan, like everything that's accomplished by the whole ecosystem of Korbanot um, that make Yerushalayim and Harabait what they're supposed to be. And yet, elements within that set of processes will also look violent, will also look like there are innocent creations, right? A sheep is the, the, the essence of hapless and innocent, right? It's an animal that didn't do anything wrong, that didn't deserve what's happening to it. But Akados Baruch Hu has decided that this one today uh, is going to be the korban. And then in this particular moment, we may have a role to play in facilitating that process that doesn't uh, make us feel maximally comfortable given our tendency towards empathy with other living things, uh, such as animals, right? And, and having a very carefully scripted and safe place in which people can practice the experience of understanding that sometimes the will of Hashem is for us to do things that do not align with our tendency to empathy. Uh, that as well is something that has been missing from Yadut for thousands of years, uh, and that perhaps not accidentally uh, is meant to play a central role in the physical plant of having a sovereign nation that's capable of defending its borders and conducting wars and all these things that also relate to the question of empathy and whether it's always the case that the right thing to do uh, is to do that which 
uh, your your ability to empathize uh, points towards. So those are three different points uh, about what what animal sacrifices are doing. I think that there's a lot more, and and there's a lot more also that could be said in, in, in detail about different aspects of Kovanot. So Bezat Hashem, we can keep doing more shiurim like this, but I think now is probably a good place to stop and discuss a little bit. I was thinking, I'm not sure this is exactly a point that you covered, but um, perhaps to appreciate, or maybe it is, uh, to appreciate life, perhaps on some level, the only way to appreciate life in the general sense is by life being taken away. And by us being part of that process, maybe it's putting that into focus. I, I Perhaps you did cover that. I'm not sure. Would you say you, you did say that or is this already a different point? Well, I think that reminds of a point I've heard before made, which I think is also true to some extent that another aspect of animal chromanote is that they, <coughs> excuse me, that they promote the contemplation of one's own mortality. And that's certainly in the instance where you're bringing a chatat, when you, you, you want to atone for sin, that there is an idea that sin and wrongdoing are connected with death in one's mind because you stand before your king and judge and you understand that you only deserve to live because you're striving to do right according to his expectations of you and that if you're you know just going to be rasha you know and, and wicked etc then uh you don't by his lights deserve to live and so if you focus on the aspect of of bringing an offering that has to do with atonement then it makes sense to say perhaps you should be contemplating your own mortality and one way to really viscerally force you to contemplate your own mortality is to see a mammal with which you have a lot of common biology die and to see the blood and to to understand uh, something about your own mortality uh, while witnessing that. But I, I think that being said, we have all these other olot and korbanot involving animals that are not necessarily about atonement for sin. You know, the olat tamid, uh, the, the daily offering that's brought twice, you know, in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, where it's just a sheep, right? So you're supposed to just uh, one sheep in the morning, one sheep in the afternoon. A priori, in, in the texts that immediately describe that, there's no sense of atonement. There's no sense of sin. Now, you could try to read in, and, and perhaps there are those who have, a sense in which there's kind of a regular atonement for the nation that is being performed there. But I think that that requires some effort of interpretation. And if we're if we're going just for the basic, the, the, the pshat is, this is a commandment. It's a mitzvah. Do this every day, twice a day. The nation has this responsibility and it, and it needs to be provided for. And um, so I, I think, and, and then when you were talking about all these other olot, you know, on, on hagim, on holidays especially, you can't just say it's all about making you contemplate mortality. It's too, that's too monochromatic. Um, there are many different kinds of animals that are brought. Uh, there are different numbers of animals that are brought, like on different days of Sukkot, for example. And so there has to be more dynamic range in this as a whole in terms of all the different symbolism and all the different things that it can represent. And contemplating mortality is part of it. Uh, but uh, if, we, if we are willing to consider the possibility that sometimes a korban is not about atonement for sin, like I think you should say, for example, a korban toda, like a, a Thanksgiving offering or a korban shlamim, where you, you basically are bringing an animal for a barbecue that you share with other people, that's not atonement for sin, but if if we if we think now too carefully about it, it starts to say, well, so when I need to atone for a sin, I, I look at this and I, I think about my own mortality, but when I want to have a barbecue with my friends and, and eat before Hashem, so to speak, then is there a sin that I'm also atoning for, or am I supposed to just forget about it in that case and just enjoy the barbecue? Um, I think it gets kind of uh, blurred. And so it's absolutely an element of things, but I think it can't be the only one. And it reminds me also to mention something else that I had um, aimed to bring in, in this last point, which is that there is an element of uh, this last point about empathy that I think also connects with this question of what I just mentioned with the olat tamid, that you just have these sheep that you're, you're bringing every day, or for that matter, any sheep that you bring, 
what's very hard for people when they when they project onto the animal the idea that it has it is like them and it, it has a perspective uh, and it stands for them in some sense there's an element of feeling like I feel bad for this animal because I'm the one who sinned uh, and I should be contemplating my mortality but this animal now has to die in order for me to have that experience and it doesn't seem at all fair to the animal like what did the animal do to deserve it animals don't do things to deserve to die or not to die they're not really moral agents and so it's we 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 default to kind of thinking an animal is kind of like a child who doesn't know any better and so then it seems really terrible what's being done to the animal and and i think one of the resolutions of this that is hard to wrap one's head around but is a a philosophical gem that's hiding in the midst of all of this that we need to hold on to is that part of what all these olot and korbanot with animals call your attention to is that Hakados Baruch Hu, uh, is the one who really makes accounts for all the different perspectives of all the living beings in the world. And we have this excessive tendency to imagine what it's like to be other human beings, certainly, and also other creatures as well. But all of that really is, at some level, what we imagine, right? Our own experience is limited to our own experience. And it gets very trippy and unmoored epistemically if you start to say, oh, you know, if you're always living in this frame of the world is created for me and there's nothing but my own experience and it's just sort of a video game uh, shared between me and Akados Baruch Hu, that, if you just tell yourself that all the time, will make you an unempathetic person and you'll end up mistreating other people and failing in many of your obligations in mitzvot. On the other hand, at some level, part of what the Torah is trying to bring us to is this idea that we are, we should use our faculty to imagine what it's like to be other people in order to successfully keep the Torah better by using empathy to do mitzvot better, etc. But we're doing that for Akados Baruch Hu ultimately, out of love of Hashem. And although we are capable of imagining what it's like to be other people, what it's like to be other people from our perspective, has to be on a lower rung of reality. Um, and that matters when mitzvot uh, slide another way and point in a different direction. So when it, when it comes to the sheep, thinking about what it's like to be a sheep and thinking about whether the sheep deserves what's happening to it, that becomes an overactivity of this human tendency we have to project onto everything around us and imagine it's also like a person. Um, and, and to attribute agency and perspective to it. That's the thing that we're best at. And we have a highly overactive ability to do that. Uh, and, and, and what the Torah is partly doing with animal sacrifice is saying, just remember before you start trying to do your own calculus of what's just in the world and, and what should or shouldn't happen uh, by imagining what it's like to be this person and what it's like to be that uh, animal, et cetera, let the korban stop you in your tracks and, and, and be a message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying, you don't really know what it's like to be anything but yourself. So if I'm telling you this animal which I created is to be given to me in this way on the altar, then that is something for you to learn from. And over here, when it's you're trying to do and you're trying to figure out how better to love your, your fellow as yourself, then use your faculty to imagine what it's like to be your, your neighbor and, and do the best you can to be a better friend to your neighbor by using that faculty. But remember that it's a faculty. Remember that it's a, a sense or an ability that you have. And then at the end of the day, this is an exchange between you and Hashem. Um, and he's the one who's really holding all the cards and, and keeping the books. In accordance with what you just said, you could argue that uh, this is an exercise in modesty. Or, or perhaps humility would be also a word, if, if I, I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. that certainly, that I think uh, the, what, the, the willingness that we're meant to show to sometimes engage in actions that put our trust in Akados Baruch Hu's judgment entirely, meaning that we have no 
ability to say this sheep is the one that deserves to be the Ola Tamid today and this one doesn't, right? We, we have criteria for selecting them based on whether they have blemishes or not, whether they're acceptable, but we don't say you in sheep politics are a sheep Rasha and you should be the Korban or, or what have you. We say this is a sheep and Hashem asks this of us and in regard to these actions, we will show our humility before Hashem and not pretend that we can be judge of what's just in the world and that the animals will help us to, uh, through a pageant that involves the killing of animals, uh, act out that uh, humility, that, that willingness to set a limit on what we can comprehend philosophically and, and judge for ourselves. Um, and, and, and then, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny because the Torah itself creates totally different situations in which how, how animals are treated in the sense that you can both have a situation where there's an ox and because it's been trampling people, there's essentially like a trial that you can hold for it to decide whether this ox should be put to death. And yet on the other hand, you also have the mitzvah of the Azazel on Yom Kippurim, where you have two identical goats and you just throw a lot and Hashem decides, all right, this is the one that's the Azazel and this is the Seir Hashem and you treat them differently. And who decides which one gets treated differently is explicitly made uh, into a goral, into the casting of a lot um, that is out of our hands and, and beyond our judgment. And so I absolutely agree. I think it is, it's, a, it's an epistemic humility about the existence of perspective beyond our own and that of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, and you can't live your whole life and, and, and operate constantly in a mindset that is in this kind of uh, epistemological tunnel vision. But sometimes we do need a nudge in that direction where Hashem is saying, look, fundamentally, you focus on yourself and your own actions and your own experiences. Those are the things that you know. Those are, you know, what you actually could rise to the level of judging if you thought about it uh, and focus on that and, and your uh, standing before me uh, as, as the one being judged. And, and don't get too overactive and zealous and haughty in, in all that you imagine you can know about what it's like to be someone else, whether it's a person uh, or an animal. Thank you very much, Dr. England. My pleasure. Take care. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz Yisrael activities in your local area, Please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.